Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at chronology in the Bible and part of a continuing series of New Testament backgrounds. The climate of Canaan is such that you have a rainy season and a dry season. Right around October or so, it begins to rain once in a while. Uh, we refer to those as the early rains, and a little bit more in November and December. By January, you're right at the peak of the rainy season. Um, it begins to dwindle a little bit by February, March. Uh, in April, you have the very last of the rains, and now begins the dry season, beginning uh, from May all the way to the next October, um, it, it doesn't rain almost at all. And maybe a few sprinkles on the coast, but throughout most of the land, it is completely dry. Now, when we speak of calendars, remember in, in, in the way we think of it, uh, we have January begins our new year. Uh, and yet, if you ever notice the names of our years or, or the names of our months, uh, for example, September comes from the Latin word septum, means seven. Um, well, wait a second. I thought September was the ninth month. And likewise, you can continue. An octagon, remember, is uh, from the, the Latin word octo means eight. Uh, the same thing for November. For November is nine. And then a decimal point, remember, is uh, the word December for des, uh, desa or decim uh, means ten. And so then the months of, of the, the names of the months that we use actually point to the fact that at some time in the past, the, the year began not in January, but around March. Now that's, that's recorded just in the way we speak of months as well. And the same was true of the Hebrew calendar. Now, you've heard per, uh, perhaps people speak of a religious calendar versus a civil calendar used by the Jews. And, and that's a little bit misleading uh, because in the Bible, any reference to months and, and years and so on, uh, a year always begins in the spring. Around March, there, remember their month doesn't add up quite to hours, but it's, it's pretty close. Uh, so around the month of March would be the beginning of the year. And you say, well, wait a second. We have Rosh Hashanah, the, the, the head of the year, the, the new year, and that's in the fall. Well, that's the civil calendar, but that's never described as such in the Bible. Uh, instead, when you see that used by our Jewish friends, they're actually borrowing from the Babylonian calendar. It was never part of the Jewish calendar. And so you had a number of feasts going all the way back to uh, the book of Leviticus, uh, from Passover all the way to the Feast of Booths. And the first four of those were in the spring. Well, Pentecost, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick that in the spring. Actually, it's, it's late spring, early summer. But I'm going to keep that as, as one of the first four spring feasts. So you have the Feast of Passover commemorated the deliverance of the Jewish people from Egypt. And that week would begin this whole uh, observance uh, beginning with Passover, and then you would have the the week of unleavened bread, as they took all the leavens from their all the leaven from their homes, uh, actually remove it from the house, to signify that that once they had come out of Egypt, they were removing all of the impurities of the old life, uh, all of the idols, all of the 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 religion, uh, the religious systems of Egypt, as they were going to follow the Lord, and then the first day of the week once that had kicked in uh, the first day of the week after following the passover would be the feast of first fruits where they of course remember in the springtime that's when they have the the harvest uh, i know some of us are uh, we think harvest is is a fall sort of thing but not in israel in israel the the harvest takes place in the spring at the end of the rainy season and so um, they would take the very first uh, fruits of the harvest. The whole harvest isn't done yet, but, but at least the first little bit has finished growing. And they would bring a, a sheaf of grain before the Lord in the tabernacle, later on in the temple, and they would wave it before the Lord. And this was a promise of new life to come. Uh, I don't think it's any accident that Jesus was raised on the first day of the week following the Passover, um, the first fruit, because he is our first fruit, uh, his resurrection is a promise that we're going to rise one day as well. You would then count 50 days after that to the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, and, um, of course, that's uh, when the Holy Spirit was given in Acts chapter 2. But prior to that, it was already being celebrated 
And the Jewish people would use that as a time where they would remember the giving of the covenant, the giving of the law. And so I think it's striking that the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost because, because he gives the law internally. He writes it into our heart. And so he's a, a perfect complement uh, to that. Now we go from Pentecost to the fall feast, and you would have uh, the first rulings of the feast. It's just uh, sort of a preview of things to come, uh, a, a blowing of trumpets that would take place. As I said, this begins the civil or Babylonian new year, but it's, it, never, it never links it to the idea of a new year in the Bible. That's not a biblical link. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, you can celebrate other things and, and have other celebrations going on. There's, there's, there's nothing uh, wrong with that. But they would, they would uh, blow a trumpet uh, at the beginning of the month saying there's, there's certain things going to come up. And then you would have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where an atonement would be made in the tabernacle. Later on, once the temple came about, uh, it would take place in the temple, an atonement made for the nation. Of course, that pictures Jesus too, what he did on the cross. Even though what he did on the cross took place in the spring, the, these fall feasts also picture Jesus. And so you'd have the Day of Atonement. And then finally, the, the Feast of Booths, sometimes we call it the Feast of Tabernacles, where it would signify the idea that when they came out of Egypt, they were tabernacle, tabernacling, they were tenting, they were living in tents, and God had tented with his people. Then, you know, you had, you had a big tabernacle, you had a, a big tent, and God came, and in a visible manifestation, the, the cloud by day, the fire by night, the, the cloud that came into the tabernacle itself, that sort of manifestation, God dwelt with his people. And of course, Jesus exemplifies that because um, in him, he, be, he became flesh and tabernacled with us. And so he completes that as well. Now, here's another look at just the, the 12 months. Uh, by the way, their months were set up according to the lunar calendar which doesn't match up quite to the way we see months. And that's why uh, I said that it roughly corresponds to, to our months. Um, but notice it goes from Nisan all the way to Adar, um, the 12 months. But there, because it's set up as a lunar calendar, um, the moon goes around the earth about once every, I think it's 29 and a half or a quarter, some odd days. Uh, and that means that every a few years you you have an extra month you have to throw in just to to get the the calendar back on track. And they would do that. Uh, so notice we've got the uh, the months set up the uh, the Nisan the, the at the first month that's when the Passover would be, uh, not just the Passover but also the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the, the ones that we mentioned, um, the the Feast of First Fruits. And then uh, 50 days later you would have Pentecost. So that's a roughly about the third month because Passover would actually take place not the very first of the month, but on the 14th day of that month. So halfway through the month. And and then you would have Pentecost still. Uh, this would now be in, in, the, in the complete dry season. Passover right at the end of the rainy season. So it's usually pretty dry then as well. Um, then you have uh, not mentioned in Leviticus because it hadn't happened yet. But the Jewish people came to commemorate the ninth of Av as the, the date on which the temple had fallen, the fall and the destruction of the temple. And you say, well, which destruction of the temple? The temple was actually destroyed twice. Remember, it was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. Uh, many hundreds of years later, 70 AD, it was destroyed again by the Romans. And both destructions took place on the same day, on the ninth of Av. Just, just so happened to, to take place like that. Now we move forward to the uh, month of uh, Tishri, uh, correlates to around September slash October. And here on that seventh month, uh, you have the feast, uh, first of the blowing of trumpets announcing it's coming, but then the Yom Kippur, the Feast of Atonement, uh, the Day of Atonement, I should say, it's not really a feast. And then the Feast of Booths, where it's an entire week of observations, where for an entire week, the Jewish people would move out of their homes and they would live in booths to remember how when they came out of Egypt, they didn't have homes. They had tents and they lived in tents uh, during that time and, and God tented with them. Uh, so it's a, a great celebration. Now you have two other things that had taken place, not in Leviticus, but much later on. Uh, first, it, it, uh, during the month of Kislev, uh, corresponds to around December, uh, you have the Feast of Hanukkah, uh, or it was also known 
Uh, in fact, it's mentioned in the New Testament in John chapter 10, makes reference to the to the um, the Feast of Lights, the the uh, of dedication and of lights, and it went by a couple different terms. And this was a time after the close of the the Old Testament, when the temple had been invaded and desecrated by by uh, the Seleucids. These were Greek peoples from the uh, living in Syria to the north, um, and they had been driven out during the days of the Maccabees, and the temple had been restored. And so this this was commemorated, and still is commemorated to this day. And that that's a great commemoration. Uh, and then finally, uh, the right at the end of the year would be Purim, and of course the story there is recorded in the book of Esther, and it commemorates the, the salvation that God brought in the days of Esther. Now, uh, that's the calendar that we have, and a number of events, both in Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, uh, are told lining up with that calendar. Some events were not given the specific day and month. For example, we're not told what month Jesus was born, and people have tried to um, come up to their best guess, and, and there's an old, actually a very old tradition that says it was December 25th, and whether that's true or not, I'm not going to really argue, um, and some people have tried to come up with other dates. Those are all guesses, um, and the Bible doesn't really tell us, and so people will continue to make guesses, and they're probably all wrong. I, I, I can't really say, um, but... There are other things that will be mentioned where the dates are going to be given. For example, Jesus being crucified at the Passover. That's going to be specifically mentioned in the New Testament. And those things we can bank on. 